All right, everybody, thanks for joining. Um, I'm, we're just gonna go ahead and get started. I know we had about 100 folks sign up and it's probably gonna be slowly trickling in uh, throughout the course, but no worries if you uh, um, wanna share this with anybody as well, you're welcome to. We'll have a recording that will circulate after this um, to make sure everybody uh, is able to join at whatever time they can. Uh, but without further ado, my name is Jorge Gaviria. I'm the founder of Masienda, and I started the company back in 2014 with a mission to really connect cultures through Masa. Um, and uh, really, I think at the end of the day, um, our journey started with, with building a supply chain that was really connecting the traditions and the origins of corn um, with folks who were really interested in diving deep into the subject, cooks, home cooks, chefs. Um, and along the way, as we started to kind of develop the supply chain, what we realized was that, you know, the thing that was missing were the tools to, to make this corn into masa. Uh, of course, the resources to create uh, mixed them all from scratch were something that we've been developing for a long time. But if you are not familiar, before Molinito existed, I mean, if you wanted to grind mixed them all into masa, you had to probably make a seven to ten thousand dollar investment, uh, which would be incredibly cumbersome, quite heavy. Um, you'd have to wait probably six to twelve months to get it to you, uh, and when you got it, there'd be almost no help whatsoever to guide it um, and to get that kind of working properly. So. You know, our goal, having seen so many home cooks and restaurant chefs go through this process, was to create something that was really accessible, lightweight, something you could easily plug into any outlet, no three-phase electricity required, and, and be able to really kind of play with this at a more accessible democratic level. And uh, Molinito has been around for about a year now. Uh, we, uh, we started, I think we launched just before COVID. And we actually had a whole tour to, to accompany the launch of this, but of course, COVID had uh, different plans for that. So this is the first opportunity we've been able to have publicly to really kind of guide um, folks on what the process is like, um, what Molinito does, what it doesn't do. Um, and we're gonna be able to get uh, some input today from two really special people. Um, the first is our very own Tony Valderrama. Um, if you um, have chatted with anybody on the wholesale hospitality side of Macienda, if you're on the, the food service uh, industry side, chances are you've probably talked to Tony, he is our resident. Um, you know, wholesale expert as well as Molinito expert. In his uh, past life, he worked at Apple as a, an Apple genius technician. So uh, machines that are far more complicated than Molinito, he was working on on a daily basis and he took those talents over to Masiana to help us really launch Molinito with the best foot forward and make sure we were giving uh, the right kind of support uh, to all users across the globe. Um, and to that note, I, I should say, we have a couple hundred users now across the world that are using Molinito on a daily basis, which is amazing. Um, and those numbers just keep climbing with the more sort of access to resources and knowledge that are out there. So this is really for us a great way to just ensure that the, the movement is move, continuing to move forward. Um, is just making sure that these types of things are available, Tony's available, and really we're sharing these resources and, and kind of insights um, with everyone in real time. Um, and uh, you know, our second guest today is uh, is very special to us as well. He was, I think, he was, I think he was the first person to have a Molinito in the world. Um, so it's like, uh, you know, the, the, the earliest adopter of them all. Uh, his name is Matt Diaz. He's going to be joining us um, in our LA studio remotely. He's in Brooklyn, New York today, uh, where he runs his restaurant for all things good, um, which uh, maybe some of you have heard of. If you have not, I highly encourage you to go there safely uh, when it is time to, to travel again for you. Um, and uh, for all things good actually was one of the most amazing stories it opened up during the pandemic. Uh, which would have been sort of a death sentence for a lot of restaurants, sadly. Matt has been able to find a way to um, create a community space that is really sort of part Molino, so part um, kind of, uh, you know, masa bakery of sorts and restaurant and really kind of a community hub, a hub in, uh, in Brooklyn um, that has really, I think, just transformed the neighborhood in a lot of really productive, beautiful ways. And at the center of that is Molinito. Um, uh, Matt, like I said, was the first person to use Molinito uh, when we launched it uh, late 2019, early 2020, and has been so valuable in giving us feedback along the way to make sure that things are being dialed in and tuned in exactly to sort of their best performance possible. Um, so we've learned a lot from Matt. Uh, I know that we've exchanged notes constantly, and hopefully he can serve as a resource for somebody who's using it who is not us in real time um, and uh, kind of serve as a witness for just how great this machine really is. Um, well, I think without further ado, um, so I don't take up too much time, I'm going to introduce Tony now and have Tony come over. Uh, Tony's going to be walking us through kind of the, the basics of how Molinito works today. 
Um, and you know, key to this is obviously we've already pre-prepared Nixtamol, so we're not going to be going into the process of how to make uh, corn into Nixtamol, uh, but we are going to be talking about how to convert Nixtamol into masa. Um, so it's going to kind of be the, the, end, the, the end stage of what that kernel to masa process looks like, uh, give you kind of a very sort of basic overview of how the machine works. Um, we'll then kick it over to Matt, who will share kind of his experiences today using Melanito and, uh, you know, give us a little bit of insights into how he launched his business, because I know, interestingly, the hundreds of folks around the world right now that have Melanito are, are largely new businesses, and they're, they're ones who have been able to launch um, very quickly and nimbly using Melanito as kind of that guiding tool. So we'll hear firsthand from Matt on just how he did that, um, and we'll have some time, uh, you know, for, for Q&A at the end and try to get every question. Um, as, we, as we kind of go through um, the presentation today, please make sure you are just including any questions that come to mind in the chat box. Those are going directly to our brand director who is behind the camera, Selena, uh, who will be making sure that those questions get up here. And anything that does not make it, um, should we run out of time, we'll make sure that we get those in a roundup email that we'll send out to everybody, uh, which will recap kind of major top points um, and, you know, also send you a recording of, uh, of the session as well in case you want to share with anybody who's interested. Um, so without further ado, let me present Tony Valderrama over here, a resident genius and a wholesale hospitality expert. Um, take it away, Tony. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Jorge. I'm going to leave the mic to today. Oh, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Tony. Uh, as already mentioned, I'm one of the uh, operation managers here at Mastienda, along with the being an expert in all things Molinito. So thank you guys so much for uh, joining us today in this session. Hopefully we can kind of uh, demystify the Molinito for you, get you a, a first-hand look at the mechanics, the basics, and uh, make some masa. Uh, so we have some mix them already, uh, as we mentioned, and then we have our Molinito here. So what I'm gonna do first is talk about the components that make up the Molinito, uh, the key features that work together in, in grinding the masa, and then, uh, and then we'll take it from there. So the first thing is that the Molinito uses uh, basalt stones. We have some over here, sorry. And the way that the Molinito grinds the mixed of all is using volcanic rock. And these are, these are basalt stones. You can see that they have a floral design uh, placed on them for the grooving. And this is done on purpose. The design is meant to go from getting the larger kernels in through the auger and then kind of grinding it and, fine, and getting it more fine as it comes out. Um, and the also benefit of using basalt is that it's very porous, uh, which means as the stones are grinding amongst each other and getting the nixum all through, uh, it evenly disperses the heat, doesn't get overheated. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's exactly what you need when you're, when you're starting to grind uh, uh, nixum up. Uh, you definitely can get warm masa, warm to the touch. It's not gonna get hot, um, but it, it helps produce this, this incredibly good uh, taste. So we have these stones, loaded in and each molinito comes with two sets so one that's going to be ready to go and then you'll have an extra set as sort of as you're using it um you know as the, as the, as the grooves start to wear down just like anything else uh, as as over time um, you'll need to get them replaced to be sharpened you can get that done uh, we'll go over that once you once you own a molinito but in the meantime you have an extra set to utilize uh to get you to get you going all right uh beyond the stones we have the machine itself uh, a countertop ready grinder, or essentially wet grinder, uh, for Nixtamog. Um, this guy is about 85 pounds in weight, so it's certainly kind of uh, capable, but it can also be moved if needed. If you needed to remove it off the counter due to space, um, it, it is certainly something that's, that you can, you can take off and, and just uh, unplug it and plug it back in whenever you need to. You may need an extra hand, um, but yeah, it's something, something you, can, you can stow away uh, when, when not in use. So the two components that are gonna be utilized in terms of getting the stones together and allowing you to control the coarseness that you're looking for um, are these two components. So we have the stone clutch lever here on the, on the side and in the back, I'm gonna grab the camera really quick and see if I can show you guys the stone clutch, the tightening knob in the back. So we have the stone clutch lever here. And then as you move towards the back, you will notice uh, sorry about the lighting here. Uh, you're gonna notice a tightening knob here. Uh, and these two components, set this guy back over here for us. Now, these two components are what allow you to start dialing in your mask and start uh, controlling the coarseness that you're looking for. The stone clutch lever, as you can see, I'm gonna allow you 
to kind of close the gap between the stones the most. Uh, this movement right here really removes most of the spacing in the stones. Uh, and that's gonna be your first, your first kind of movement. Then you have the turning, the tightening knob here in the back of the showed. Those are for those incremental sort of adjustments that are needed. So you can really fine tune the coarseness that you're looking for, um, whether you're trying to make tamales or tortillas, any kind of masa shape. The, turn, the tiny knob there is really what's going to allow you to set sort of the, the, the desired coarseness that you're looking for. Um, beyond that, inside, inside the tiny knob, there's also a nut that you can use to kind of secure your position. So you don't have to fiddle with it every time. Really, once you're dialed in, all you'll need to do is engage the lever, start grinding. When you're done, disengage, remove the hopper, take out the stones, and then when you need to go again, load them up and then just engage them. You don't have to fiddle with the tiny knob in the back every session. Again, once you're dialed in, this is just gonna be your go-to, sort of a, a setting and forget it. Um, we are gonna have resources once you, once you own a Molinito that'll walk you step-by-step step in getting, that, getting your masa to the point that you're looking for. It's, it's, critical, it's very fast. Um, it's maybe like a five to, to, to seven minute dialing in process. But once you're there, you'll be good to go. Uh, the other component that we have on the Molito is the hopper here in the front. This guy right here is where one of the stones rests. And so, hold on, let me grab the stones for you, for a better example. So we have in here is the auger. One stone sits in the back. The other stone is attached here to the, the hopper plate. And then we have the pins right over here that secure the hopper plate into place. And then, so if I can move it around really quick to give you an idea. And then this is where the masta is going to be dispensed. We have the feeding tray, which is where we're going to store our nixtamal. And what we use to feed it into the hopper, inside the hopper, let me show you, is the auger. And that's what pulls in the, um, pulls in the nixtamal so that it can start getting being fed uh, between the stones. Um, yeah. So that's sort of a basic rundown of the Molinito. Um, it can churn out about 45 pounds, 45 to 50 pounds of masa um, per, per hour. Uh, and it can run, honestly, it can run eight hours per day. Uh, one thing that will go alongside with it is sort of just proper maintenance. Uh, the two aspects of that are gonna be, you know, resharpening the stones. This is something you can do daily, just like you could with sort of a, a, a knife that you have in your kitchen. Uh, and to kind of expand its life, or you know, eventually you'll need to replace the stones. Uh, the other maintenance that is going to be needed on the Molinito is lubrication. Uh, inside, uh, this casing can easily come off, and then uh, inside you'll need to lubricate it because there's housing that has ball bearings. Uh, you want to just make sure, you know, depending on usage, every month, every two months, you're properly lubricating it and making sure it's a, it's a, essentially a well-oiled machine. Um, and yeah. That's sort of the, the, the run around basics. It's really just sort of once you get dialed in, plug and play on the Molinito. Um, I think what I want to do right now is start grinding and show you uh, how, how it can come out with the masa and how it's going to look with freshly mixed in the mold. We have right here our Conico Rojo mixed the mold, and I'm going to now feed it. Apologies if it starts to get a little loud. Uh, the machine is grinding the stones. Uh, so we're going to take a look and see how this runs. All right. Um, what we'll need is we've loaded the mix amount into the feeding tray. Um, but now what I'm going to do is put a little bit of the mix amount into the hopper itself and add a little bit of water here to the tray. Perfect. Now, as you see, our uh, stone clutch lever here is disengaged, meaning it's, it's pushed all the way to the back. And we have our tiny knob here loose. What we want to do initially is coat the stones so that they're not grinding on each other right away. Um, once we coat it with some nixtamal, um, then we're going to be good and, go, and, and ready to go to, to make some, some masa. So first, make sure your um, stone class lever is disengaged so we can just run through uh, the stones that are open, get some nixtamal running into them. All right, here we go. This, of course, is going to be very coarse masa. Again, I'm just priming the stone to get it ready. Right there. Just going to run it for a few seconds. We, we recommend actually to pulse it so that you can kind of get it in all angles. All right. You 
can see this is where the, the masa is coming from. It's, we're getting very thick kernels, definitely what we're expecting. Again, it's really just toast the masa. And now what we'll do is we're going to engage this lever. That again, brings the stones closer together uh, and we'll see how the masa is. We may need to, to tighten it up in the back and sort of finesse the, the coarseness. Uh, but right now I wanna just see where we're at and starting with uh, to see what that masa looks like. So need a bit more. Now, I know sort of my first instinct when I, when I had the Molenita and was playing around with it was to fill this hopper up all the way and just turn it on and let it sort of bring in as much, as much of the next small as it could. A key note is that the stones have an efficiency rate at which they can grind in. And so you don't want to overfeed them uh, because what will end up happening is it won't be able to properly grind every kernel that's being fed into it. So you'll find some coarse bits um, it won't be consistent. And even though you're like, you're tiny it and tiny again, those stones so close together, overfeeding it will still play a role in sort of the consistency that you're getting. Um, it doesn't affect the yield uh, in terms of how to feed it, but we recommend to do slow, consistent feeds. And you'll still be able to achieve that uh, 50 pounds of masa within an hour, um, but it's actually gonna be ready to go and like fine and dialed in masa right from the beginning. So I'm gonna practice that right now. I'm gonna do slow, consistent feeds. Uh, get a little bit of masa going here so I can test and see if it's something I need to tighten up or, or tweak at all. A bit more water. Perfect, so we have some masa coming out here. Oops. Give it a good feel. Yeah, this is definitely, I don't know if you can see it. It's, it's still got a little bit of the coarse bits in there. It's starting to get very fine, a little tacky. So I'm probably gonna pull back on the water I've been adding, uh, but I think we're, we're pretty close to getting dialed in. Let me, keep on, let me keep on feeding it right now. One thing to note is you definitely don't want to put your, your hand into the hopper. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. That's what I like to have sort of a bit of water around. It helps loosen up the stickiness of the nixtamol once it starts kind of adhering to the edges here. Um, so as it's going, don't throw your hands in the auger. Don't put any tools in there. Really just kind of float some, some water in to kind of let the, let the side nixtamol fall into the auger so that it can, it can pull it out. All right, so we're going to start grinding a bit more. Take a look. It's looking good. It's looking like snowflakes. That's kind of what you're looking for in terms of getting that, that very, very fine muscle. All right. Guys, I think actually, I think we're there. Take a look at this. I hope you guys can see how fine this masa is. Again, it's not as tacky as it was before. Pulled back a little bit on the water, um, but this is an incredibly fine masa. I think we're good to go. Um, if, if, for instance, if this was coarse for whatever reason and still wasn't as as, um, as fine as I, as I would prefer. What I would do then is to sort of disengage this lever so that we release the tension on the stones, come back here and do a quarter turn on the tightening knob. Again, a little bit goes a long way once we're, once we're there, once the stones are already touching, a little bit goes a long way and, and, and bringing that, that coarseness down even more and getting it even super fine. Uh, along with that tightening knob in the back, we have the securing nut that you'll want to, once you've quarter turned it, turn that nut against the wall to tighten it. You can see the, the one horsepower machine inside of it can actually vibrate, vibrate the, the stones a bit and you don't want to lose that setting. So we have that tiny nut in the back to save that setting. So right now, 
I'm gonna make sure it's now we're pretty tight. Actually, I should have tightened more. Here we go. Now we're fully tight. I'm gonna I'm gonna grind the rest of this mix them all really quick, and then so you can see more of what it looks like in production and, and see what it looks like going for for a bit longer. All right, so I'm gonna turn it on and we'll we'll do the rest of this mix them all so you can see. Cool. Again, I'm doing slow, consistent feeds on the mix them up and not filling up the hopper. Right, let's take a look here. Perfect. Yeah, you can see the speed at which you, you dispense it still allows it to produce a good amount of masa. This is about, this is probably shy of about a pound, maybe a little bit under 0.75 right here of masa that we've gotten done in just a few, few minutes. Um, really the only process you need is to get it dialed in. And once you're there, it's sort of just, you know, plug and play, feeding the masa. You're good. You have great muscle to go. We're going to have some tortillas later on. <laughs> All right, I'll pass it off to Jorge now. He's going to come over. Thank you guys so much. Please feel free to ask any questions and keep them coming. Thanks so much, Tony. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so, guys, uh, we are going to turn it over now that we've had a second to chat with, um, with Tony on this. We're going to turn it over to Matt Diaz, uh, who I mentioned is the, one of the kind of the, the chef owners of For All Things Good in Brooklyn. And um, I'll let him tell you a little bit about kind of where the name came from and, and the story of opening it. But um, what I love about Matt uh, and his approach has just been very, very open and kind of taking nothing for granted in terms of what he learned uh, as, he, as he launched this project. In fact, I first met Matt through a class that uh, we were teaching, he was back in September, 2019 for a corn conference of all things. And um, just a, a consummate student of the craft and somebody who's constantly looking for new ways to kind of improve. Um, he's added his own really great flourishes that we've learned a lot from to the masa making process um, and specifically using uh, Molinito. So um, I'll let Matt take it from here. Matt, this is just super conversational, nice way to kind of get to know you for all things good. A nice, uh, a nice plug for all things good. And, uh, and yeah, uh, we're excited to hear your story a little bit. Thanks, Dan. Hey, hi everyone. Um... So as Jorge mentioned, I'm Matt from For All Things Good. Um, yeah, Jorge and I met actually kind of in the, uh, the pre-planning stage for when we were trying to open it up, this cafe, which was like a couple of years long probably. And just by coincidence, like a year before we opened up, there seemed to be a lot more events around corn in New York. There was like a corn symposium, which I, is kind of where we met. Some other talks about corn. Um, yeah, and also very lucky for me, uh, Jorge launched his Molinito right at the point where we were getting really close to, to finalizing a space. And it's actually kind of funny because I ordered this Molinito months before we signed a lease. And I basically had told my girlfriend she's just gonna have to live with Emil being in our very small Brooklyn kitchen for a while. <laughs> and initially the idea was and this is pre-COVID, not realizing how much free time we would have, um, kind of just figure out and mix them all. It wasn't necessarily um, thinking about learning how to use the mill for like a, a commercial purpose. It was more or less just having a mill so that we could learn how to mix them all corn. There's not a ton of information on it uh, from a practical sense and, and just practice really. Um, I, you know, as Orhe mentioned that getting a mill, like a professional mill, it's quite daunting. It's, you know, $10,000. It's months of pre-order. It's weird technical electrical issues like that you need uh, when you're putting it into space. Um, so when Molinito came out, it was like, oh, wow, 
Like we could just buy a mill that is really affordable, all things considered, uh, and plug it in and get going. Um, the more I started using it, the more I kind of realized that I think for our concept that for all things good, which is really not trying to be a, a tortilleria that does wholesale. We're just trying to make tortillas for the customers who walk in our door and then make masa for our food. I realized like, you know, we might actually just be able to use this molinito for service. And we started like learning how to mill more than learning just how to make nix them all. And that was a really quite a fun experience. And luckily I had a lot of extra time to do it <laughs> thanks to COVID coming in and kind of um, pushing back all of our plans. We had signed our lease for For All Things Good in, in February, which, you know, sounds like a horrible happenstance to sign it right before, you know, COVID. But in all honesty, it, it, it's the best thing that could have happened because one month later, I would have not signed that lease and I wouldn't have this business now. Um, so we, you know, we figured out how to kind of squeak by um, and make it through the tough part. But looking back on it now, I, I couldn't have imagined doing it any other way. I spent all of COVID while everyone was doing sourdough, just <laughs> learning how to, to mill with this machine and learning different ways in which, you know, we could make it work for us. Kind of as Tony was explaining, you know, we use a method where we just have a really steady stream of almost like singular kernels going in through the mill at a time, which you just get used to after a while. Um, as well as a little bit of ice, because as you can imagine, if you're going in, you know, one or two kernels at a time, that corn tends to sit between the stones for a little bit longer, uh, and you run the risk of it getting heated up. So we run uh, a little bit of water, a little bit of ice, and really, really slowly to get a super, super fine grind on our corn. Um, but yeah, I, I literally can't imagine how we, our business would have looked without the Molinito. It's, it sits in our kind of open kitchen. It takes a little bit longer for us to grind, but customers come in, they see us making our, our masa. It gives them this, that much more of an engagement with the process and, and what it means. All the little kids that come in think it's just Play-Doh. So <laughs> there's always a percentage of loss of masa that we just hand out to little kids, but it's cute, man. And um, I'm excited to see you know how this product changes heirloom corn in the US. I, I think as Jorge kind of mentioned, you know, one of the biggest obstacles to having a master program in a restaurant is it's a huge investment, you know, of money and of space, you know, like, especially for places that are already open and are thinking like, hey, we want to add a master program to an already existing restaurant. Like, this is such a great way to do it. You know, it's, it's not that much of a hurdle and you could probably fit it in, in any kitchen. I mean, please come into our cafe and see our kitchen. <laughs> it is about as small as you could imagine for like a tiny Brooklyn cafe. Awesome. Yes, Matt, um, can you hear me okay, by the way? Yeah, I can hear you great. Okay, great. Uh, we get, we're getting some feedback from uh, Pico Boulevard, so I apologize if you're picking any of that up. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think what I love, one question actually is, yeah. were you a trained chef before you opened up this restaurant? No. I mean, what was your experience going into this and no, your experience I, with I, Mixed Ball? You know, I have a, a background in um, winemaking and then cultural anthropology. And I kind of got sucked into corn in a weird way where I spent a lot of time in Mexico City with my business partner, Carlos Macias, who's from there, uh, and traveling around Mexico and kind of just getting fascinated with the food culture. Um, and then trying to like, for just selfish reasons, get good tortillas in New York. But the more I kind of dove into what made a good tortilla, what made good masa, and learning about heirloom corn, I just got super fascinated in a similar way that I did for wine for a while in just like the intense amount of history that goes behind corn production and corn cultivation. You know, 10,000 years of, of this crop being the backbone of civilization in this continent. Um, so now I had no culinary background, just in an intense obsession with learning more about heirloom corn. Um, and yeah. <laughs> that's that's yeah and, and then you started a business around it yeah, yeah i can and, i can relate right. <laughs> i was shocked that you know when we opened i thought we were a, a cafe and, and a molino you know like making tortillas and can, and you, I wrote can a, you kind of for folks who don't know what that is like a how would you describe a molino oh yeah so a molino 
you know, can have a lot of different meanings. The one that word, you know, the, the literal meaning is mill. And in some contexts, it's a place where you can go bring corn that you've nixed lies or, or other, you know, your chiles and they'll grind it for you. And in other places, it's more of like a full service thing where you're, it's a place that mills corn and then makes masa and you can buy your fresh masa and tortillas. Um, and I was going to say, I was just, I was shocked how popular our food got because it was really, you know, we built that menu of food around just showing what you could do with masa that wasn't just tacos, you know, which is why we have so many weird things on the menu. Um, so it was kind of a little bit scary when people were like eating there, like we were really busy as a restaurant because I was like, oh man, we got to learn how to cook. Like <laughs> I can't be doing this menu for much longer, you know, like <laughs> our, our restaurant service is going to outgrow my ability as a chef. So, but we're getting there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I, I thought it was amazing when we were, you we were getting started. We met at this, this one uh, event in, in Manhattan at Rosie's actually, shout out yeah. to Rosie's another great partner. Um, and I remember just being like, man, you're going to get, you're going to get like full into this and you don't have a space yet. I was like, I don't know if he knows like how much is happening, but yeah, I was amazed that before you started, um, you actually started to sell the masa out of your apartment to basically oh, yeah. like fund your practices <laughs> and things like that. Right. Like I remember like a lot of folks in the, the industry, the restaurant industry were texting me be like, do you know this guy, you know, Matt oh, God, yeah. making masa <laughs> It's well, like out of his apartment, I was like, "Yeah, he's totally cool. He's he's on he's on the same team. Uh, trust yeah. me." Yeah. Well, it, it's kind of funny. So, to give you a full background of how we actually opened, I had a full time job um, when we opened this. I was doing sales full time for a wine and spirits company, and when COVID hit, like everything was remote. So I was just kind of working from home. And as I said, I I was ordering a lot of corn from you guys, but like the small bags and just kind of right. figuring out what corns I like to just getting a hands-on like practical approach to like mix them all. And I had started our Instagram account and I don't even remember what I was posting, but probably horrible photos of like milling, but people would start like DMing us being like, Hey, do you have tortillas? Do you have masa? And I was like, sure, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. And I remember feeling kind of bad because I was selling it at a novelty price, like just anything, just to, just to do it. But then people would like, you know, they were making their breads or like cakes at home. So people would like give me gifts all the time. And I felt like it would probably cost more for them to make like that, you know, banana bread <laughs> that they gave me when they bought the masa than the masa I just sold them. I almost felt bad charging people. But yeah, no, it started on Instagram and like, it was shocking how many people were buying from it. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, you really illuminated the possibility of kind of like pre Molinito for us, we were selling to established restaurants and folks who were kind of like, you know, you know, had like, there was a different kind of idea of what a restaurant meant at that time, you know, pre COVID. And I think mm -hmm. what was been so amazing starting with you and for all things good is just how much community sort of based um, like nourishment. It's like goes beyond a restaurant. It was just like such a very simple concept that started without like, crazy business plan and like tons of funding. I mean, you were able to launch this on a shoestring budget okay. and yeah. now have one of probably to me, at least one of the most important restaurants in New York at the moment um, that is serving a community and really kind of uh, stewarding people through the educational process of what Masa is and can be. Um, it's so exciting, man. It's, it's, it is so much fun just, and people are excited about it. I, another thing that surprised me was like how, you know, we put the cafe element to this as a way to kind of like hedge our bets on how long it would take for people to understand like what a Molina was and like why they should buy fresh tortillas as if you know like they would buy bread from a bakery um and people caught on like literally immediately like there was no learning curve which was kind of cool I think people were ready for it mm -hmm. yeah it's amazing I mean to think certainly so everybody knows I mean obviously Mas has been around for thousands of years we don't know exactly how long um but it's been around for a really long time suffice to say but you know, uh, a quick history about this is that, you know, in the early, so I'd say like around the, the earliest 20th century is when things start to really change with convenience and Maseka came on board. And um, that's when I think we started to kind of move farther away from what this process of the traditional method is, right? Which is preparing uh, masa from kernel to masa and nixtamalizing it, milling it with basalt zones, the whole thing. Um, and, you know, there were, of course, tortillerias along the way. I mean, in, in your backyard in Queens, we've got uh, mm -hmm. Tortilleria Nixtamal, which is, I think, was the first one actually doing Nixtamal in New York City proper. 
um, that started, you know, I think about 13, 15 years ago now. Um, but it was a novelty because, you know, for all intents and purposes, Maseca was the thing that was being used everywhere. And though it seemed like, you know, a true tortilleria in that kind of romantic sense, it, it oftentimes, more often than not, they were using Maseca, which was sort of the shortcut to mm -hmm. this process. And of course, it completely takes away the supply chain that you would expect, um, or, you know, there is no sub talk of the supply chain. There is no kind of deeper understanding about like what flavor could be if you were sourcing from different parts of the world and particularly Mexico, where of course this food originates. And I think what's amazing is, you know, around 2014, a few restaurants started opening up in New York City, Cosme and Bayonne, um, you know, we've got friends here in Southern California, Taco Maria, all folks who were starting mm -hmm. to really kind of play with this and kind of, I think, set the, set the table for really a movement that is now with the introduction of the right, you know, milling equipment has really taken off. And now there's hundreds of people around the country and the world now who you're able to do this. And um, yeah, I mean, it's amazing to me to think like we're in the midst of it, but it's really, I think, just getting started. Would you? Would oh, you totally. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's interesting, again, on Instagram, you know, we were selling masa, but we also connected with a lot of other Molinos across the country. And it's, it's a fun little community. We actually all talk to each other. Um, That's awesome. From time to time, especially in the beginning, you know, a lot of us started relatively, like, you know, we might've been a little bit ahead of the curve, um, but a lot of us started relatively at the same time. So a lot of just support and questions and technical questions and, and just sometimes just exactly that support me like, no, yeah, that's happens for us too, or whatever it might be, you know? Yeah. You know, I'm fascinated to see it happening. Yeah. It's amazing. Thanks for being a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think with that, um, we'll start jumping into some questions if that's cool, Matt. And then uh, sure. I'll, I'll feel anything that's tiny specific. We are working with one headphone here. So <laughs> I will, I will do my best to share the questions out loud, but um, so Let's see, I'll put this one to you, Matt. Um, is it fair, and this is from Russell, uh, is it fair mm -hmm. to say that this is a hands-on operation? Do you need to stand and monitor the grind and adjust continuously? Um, yes, at, at, at least in the very beginning and then periodically, therefore, like you can, you could, you know, as your stones start to wear out, you need to start making more and more adjustments, but there's probably a week at a time, for example, where you have everything dialed in. And as long as someone who knows what they're doing is at the mill, you could expect to get the same result. But yeah, it's not something you can just like set and forget for long periods of time. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think like, you know, working in kitchens, I, I think I like, and it's like cooking risotto, you know, or a pasta. It's like, you're, you're never leaving it for an extended period of mm -hmm. time. And it's like, I think Folks tend to think that this is going to be a super involved process, but it's no more involved cooking than, you know, a lot of the things you would be prepping out for a menu you know, yeah. at a restaurant anyway, right? Yeah, totally. Cutting tomatoes. Like, you're not stepping <laughs> away from that process. Yeah. That's the process. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, you know, Russell, for what it's worth, I think it's a, it's it's easily demystified when you recognize it's we're just cooking, and it's like cooking anything else you might have in your kitchen. Um, so this is a question from Ricardo. Um, I have a storage question. How should I store my fresh masa and how long will it keep before I make tortillas? Uh, he's a home cook and would like to make fresh tortillas daily without having to prep mix them all every night. Um, yeah, uh, you wanna take a stab at that now? Yeah, sure. I, I would say, to, you know, there's a few things that will affect how long your masa is gonna last. One is how much cow you're using when you nix them all. Um, if you're using a lot of cow, you know, there are some sacrifices to it, but your, your masa will last a little bit longer. That's something you could, you know, weigh out yourself if you, you want to do that. We use really the minimal amount of cow that we can to get nixtamalization going. Um, and our masa lasts probably about three days, four days, if we really wanted to. Um, the best way to store it in an airtight container, a plastic bag is what we would use. So you could really make sure that there's no air in there. And then just refrigerated just well refrigerated yeah I, I i agree with that i'd say from our experience definitely the more cow you add the longer it will last mm -hmm. i think this is where you start getting into like the subjectivity of cooking right like and you go to mexico city or here in los angeles so many folks are used to i mean up to four percent cow um for the weight <laughs> of corn uh, which you know we use one percent i don't know what you use Matt, yeah. more or less around one percent we use between one and one point two percent 
Yeah. Or actually, so there, there are some varietals where we use um, 0.8%. Right, right. And usually to preserve the colors and things like that, right? Yeah. For, for yeah. blue corn, like blue corn eco specifically, sometimes we'll drop down to 8% and it just keeps a super bright, bright blue color. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's different in other parts of the world and, and it, there's nothing that's right or wrong, but to know what's happening on that, you know, the more cow you put into it, cow is a, is a highly basic substance. So it keeps on the pH scale, it's going to keep something a little bit sort of um, closer to shelf stable because it's, it's a less hospitable environment to bacteria. Um, that's kind of on a, whether it's good to eat or not, that answers that question. But I'd say one note is that over the course of a couple of days, you start to see that starch degrade a little bit. So, you know, you want to make sure you're adding some water and remixing, reconstituting that masa before you go use it. Um, is at least in our experiences now, I don't know if that's something you feel like yeah. you guys do too. <laughs> Even if we have masa from like the night before that we wind up using, which is usually about as long as our masa will ever last, we always add water to it. That's to awesome. Get the right consistency again. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to cool. massage it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Just work it back into kind of that flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got another question from Daniel regarding cold storage. I guess this is... No, it's kind of on the same space. Um, Daniel, if you feel like we did not answer the question through Ricardo's question, you can shoot us another one and we'll, we'll get to it. Um, Matt, do you make masa to order or make a batch for service? Not you know, we, we do make masa to order. We were, you know, we'll request people ask us in advance if they want like a larger portion of masa or more specifically, if they want masa for tamal, which is going to be a different grind setting. So we'll, we'll just want to know, because we're only grinding once in the morning. Um, but we try to make enough masa to sell for people just to walk in. Like not everything is, is made to order. You know, we keep, you know, as much as we can um, just for walk-in sales. We want to, you know, spread the masa love. So we don't want to make it difficult for people to come in and get masa. So I do feel bad. We do run out of masa quite a bit. So we're, we're working on it. Awesome. Um, another question. Uh, this one's from Rudy. How much do you wash your next demol personally, Matt? Oh, we we do a light wash, to be honest with you. We, you know, again, talking about cow usage, because we use such a, a small amount of, of cow to keep some elasticity in our corn, we, we tend to just rinse out. I don't want to say too lightly, but just really clean the corn, but leave quite a bit of the skin on. I would, I would almost say we go 50 50 and how much skin we leave and that, that helps keep the core your your tortillas rather like with a bit of elasticity to it totally yeah and those conico varieties have even less kind of um sort of protein because they have such a lot of hot, uh, that soft starch so it definitely mm -hmm. comes in handy to start with kind of a little bit more skins it's going to keep that stuff down mm -hmm. exactly yeah the, the overall rinsing rudy and you might have seen the video we have a mine i think it's it's definitely subjective um you know the kind of flavor you want to impart. Um, elasticity is a really big piece there, um, you know, and also the color and the aesthetic of it, you know, that mm -hmm. there's definitely some of that retained cow in the skins and that turns yellow and that can paint a blue corn tortilla a little bit more green or a little grayer. So it's totally your call, but I think uh, there is no right or wrong answer, but I agree with Matt, you know, 50-50 is probably where I would start too. And you can literally separate 50% and just eyeball it. Or you can weigh it too if you want. You put 50% of it you know, to the side, don't rinse it and wash really vigorously on the other 50% mm -hmm. and you should have a good, kind of a good starting place there. Um, all right, uh, we'll kind of wait for some additional questions to come in, but um, I'd say just answering some frequently asked questions we got coming into this as a, as before we close out today. So um, describing the 15% off uh, feature that we have for all Molinito users, um, there's a little bit of confusion around what that means. So basically we have a wholesale price at $1.10 a pound and that's for all varietals, no matter what um, the actual cost is of that to us. We kind of just wanted to make it really simple for everybody. We offer an additional 15% off to everybody who is buying directly from um, Macienda for all of their corn. And that is uh, basically getting you to about what a pallet price would be without having to purchase a pallet. So even if you're ordering a bag at a time, you could do that. Um, and, um, you know, we, uh, we, we just want to make sure it's as, as accessible as possible, um, to all of our members. To that note, we also have members only varietals, which actually Matt meant to tell you this, we're launching a, a whole, a whole group, uh, hasn't launched yet, but I um, will be having, um, you know, a handful of varietals at any given time that are not available to the public. So stuff that you will be able to showcase 
um, if for all things good and no one else will have, it'll be a fun piece of, uh, of kind of the exclusivity to what we offer Molinito member, uh, club members. Um, and a couple of other things, somebody asked, uh, you know, do you have a manual um, and uh, kind of a user guide to this? I'll be totally honest, we, we do have a user guide, which, you know, I know Matt, uh, Matt has as well, but we've actually expanded on that quite a bit. And now we we'll have actually a private YouTube channel um, that you'll be able to check things out at. So, um, you know, whether it's how to care for your Molinito, lubricate it, um, you know, how to properly load the stones, all of that stuff uh, has been covered there. And a lot of, I have to say, Matt has probably been one of our, our closest allies in uh, kind of just making sure we're understanding how this is being used in real time our canary in the coal mines. So Matt, <laughs> thank you for helping us generate a lot of this content, man, because of course, we've man. been going through it and, and uh, we want to make sure everybody has exposure to the right, you know, the right details and the right tips. Uh, we've got another question coming in, but in the meantime, I'm just going to kind of stay on that note um, and ask you, I mean, this is a personal plug, Matt, how often, I mean, if you have a question about something that's only need to related, how do you go about getting in touch with uh, the Masiana team? Oh yeah. So, you know, it's easy to just email it, you guys and people are really quick to respond. And from time to time, Jorge and I will just have a little catch up on stuff, which has been a fun experience over the course of, of COVID when you're so devoid of like talking to people these days. But um, yeah, no, everyone on, on, on the, uh, the Molinito team is, is super responsive. Um, and we've had every single problem you can imagine. <laughs> and we've always been, worked out at some point or another so yeah thanks Matt. no you've been you've been amazing man um all right well we're, we're close to wrapping up i've got two last questions um for matt how long do you cook tortillas and package them for sale how long do you cook tortillas well we we only sell the tortillas that we make that same day mm -hmm. um it, for advice on like cooking tortillas i, I know you guys have like um a video on it which I think was pretty accurate, you know, just in terms of it's a pretty quick time to cook a, a single tortilla. Um, you're just searing on, you know, one side, searing and cooking on the other, and then flipping last just to get your puff. But yeah, we'll we'll cook our tortillas, and then ideally, if we're not making them to order, we'll let them cool and then package them, and we'll sell them that day. We usually sell out of the ones that we package in the morning, and then we make them to order. At which point, we will package them a little bit more loosely so that the steam can go out and we just let people know that if they don't finish it to just put it in something airtight. Awesome. And uh, for somebody who is moving away from Mas Arena to do their own mixed mall, if you could kind of break down what the benefits are in terms of like quality, um, like just kind of, you've, I, I'm assuming you've used Mas Arena at oh, of course. points, right, Matt? I thought I was like, So like, you how know, would you compare? <laughs> Into, How would you, you know, the difference? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's a total different ballpark. There, there's something, there's like, there's nothing like feeling fresh masa, just the way it's so cohesive. You know, when you're using masarena, it's, it's no matter how, there's no amount you could mix it together that it's not going to still feel to some degree like particles that were just kind of blended together, you know? Of course, when you get fresh masa out of the mill, it it has its own, it feels like clay, you know, like mud clay. Like it's, it feels completely integrated. Um, in terms of cooking, it's way easier to work with, you know? Um, and the longer you work with it, the more visual clues you get about how you're cooking your tortillas and stuff. It, it, it speaks back to you. Um, I feel like Maseca is just a little bit more, it'll get a, a job done, but it, it doesn't have as much flexibility in how you work with it and how you cook with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think on our side, we, um, we use the same single origin supply chain that, you know, at Masienda mm -hmm. to make our Masarina. And I think it's an amazing gateway. And also just, totally. you know, if you run out, it's a great bandaid uh, to have if you need something in a pinch, but you definitely lose that control. You know, like, yeah. it's like, we have done it all for you. There's really not much you can do. Uh, to make it your own beside, you know, seasoning it, maybe adding color to it, um, certainly yeah. cook, you know, cooking the tortilla or whatever, but the range of variables you control in that kernel Tomasa pro process, including the grinding, um, is just like, you make it really personally your own. 
and it becomes much more sort of active consumption than passive. Um, oh man, we're getting a lot of questions for you, Matt. We'll, we'll try it's to okay. all these <laughs> I'm here. So, um, so how much moss are you preparing daily, and is there a time limit on continual usage? Yeah, we we only use the masa from the current day, and then we'll use our masa from the night before for things like tostadas and clayuritas as we make them. I think they're gonna get dried out anyway. Um, we have the most roundabout way of counting our masa. We'll, we'll measure everything in grams before we cook it. <laughs> um, and then that will kind of, so if you have six kilos dry corn, that would be after cooked about 10 kilos, which would be about 20 pounds. So there's a lot of calculation there, um, but I would guesstimate about 60 pounds a day based on that. We're usually doing about 16-ish kilos dry corn. So kind of almost by almost times four, just under times four is how you do that. About 60 pounds. That's a healthy amount. I mean, I know even larger seating restaurants that are going through about the same, and it's amazing you guys are able to crank that out in that space. We sell out to. <laughs> There's some days where I'm like, man, I wish we could make more, but yeah, that that's also tends to be a just about the limit. We also don't have any like, we're very limited in our kitchen, so everything's on induction burners, and those only pots can only get so big for that still to function well. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting. Yeah, that's about our max. We could probably crank out a little bit more. Thanks, Matt. Um, let's see. Uh, do you grind chocolate or spices with your molinito? Uh, we've tried it. We've tried it. Um, but I think our hands have been full so far with what we've been doing, but maybe down the line. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, there's a learning curve to, to everything that you want to do. So at some point I would love to do it. We've, we've tried to make salsa matcha through our mill, try to make salsa. We put a lot of things through that mill to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a workhorse, man. It's like the, the original yeah. Vitamix, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, we typically use hardwood ash to make mixed malt. Have you used ash versus cow? Um, I can answer that as well, uh, but curious if you guys have actually. Well, I've not, but I'm very curious about it. Very, and I've heard other people doing it too. So yeah, fascinating. Do you, oh, you guys have a, you can get a neighbor in, in the neighborhood who can probably get you some ash since you're on induction, but I think it's like, it's definitely an amazing way to kind of repurpose obviously waste and the flavor is totally different. Yeah. Um, yeah it's maybe we'll do that one of these days. We're, we're, we're close to yeah. a wood fired pizza place that's down the block. So maybe I can get them to give us some ash. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think in our experience, uh, a question came from T. I don't know the full name. Um, but, uh, you know, we, you definitely need to use a lot more ash than you do cow because that. it's a little bit less basic. I think it's actually like one, um, it's like one degree one uh, one integer of basicness less um, than you would normally expect a cow for example so you just need to use I think about double the quantity um, but we do like a basically a quick light where we'll heat the the, um, the ash up with some water oil in it for about 30 minutes let it sit and then mm -hmm. kind of the liquid that separates the top is sort of a, a, a developing lye that actually has quite a high ph um, oh, and what it does for the flavor is it really kind of imparts like a hardwood kind of campfire flavor, which is delicious. So it's a good way to complement cool. certain proteins you want to do. Um, and yeah, we'll be doing a video on that soon. So just as a shout out, if you want to take a look at it, we cannot see it. Um, I think we're, we're wrapping up on time. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Let's see. How do you cook tortillas? Got that. Uh, oh, one question we did about the sound. I don't, I don't think the sound of Molinito was coming through in the audio because it was like protecting the microphone from blowing up. But uh, there is definitely sound on Molinito. <laughs> it's not uh, it's not crazy loud like you would expect in a large tortilla. But um, yeah, I mean you've got neighbors all around there, Matt. Like any complaints on, in terms of how loud it is? How you compare it to other things you use in the kitchen? Um, it can get a little loud, uh, but nothing crazy. And now that we're in the kitchen. You know, and, and again, like we have an open kitchen, so it's not loud enough that it's actually affecting any anything in service, which is directly in front of it. So it's not that loud. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we, we uh, have a really, if, if, if she's here and listening, I'm sorry, but we have a very uh, cantankerous neighbor and she's never shut us down when we're doing mixed small here. So it's, it's not that <laughs> loud, 
Uh, but yeah. definitely, uh, as you're getting dialed in, and those stones are kind of don't have any mixed muscle circuit going through, can get a little loud. But pretty manageable. Um, well, Matt, thank you so much for your time today and oh, thank you for having your, me. your best practices. Um, we are going to be circulating this as a recording to kind of the whole, you know, the whole community. So thanks for for being a part of it. Um, to everybody who joined at home or work, thanks for for uh, participating with us. Um, please feel free to email us at info at if you have any follow-ups. And Matt, if anybody wants to get in a hold of you, should they just do that? DM you at uh, for all things good. Yeah, um, please do actually. Yeah, if you have any questions, especially any like technical questions or want some support, I've been doing that for the entire time of our business with a few other Molin uh, Molinos. So join in. Awesome. Um, yeah. And on our our end, we um, we are launching a Reddit uh, channel. If you guys want to kind of bring this conversation out into the open, because I know that everybody's got kind of the same questions, you start to see this thread is, is pretty similar across uh, these inquiries. So you know, we uh, will share that and uh, if you uh, can join us and kind of just making that conversation as kind of open as possible so folks can kind of use this as a collective resource. Masa has always been a very folkloric tradition, like oral tradition, so it'd be cool to kind of keep that alive um, on the internet in an organized place. Um, totally. But um, anyway, guys, thank you all so much, Matt. Thank you. Tony, thank you for, for leading us through our demo today. And uh, yeah. Give us a shout if you have any questions at info.mosina.com. We'll talk to you soon. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.